Hi, Misha here. And if you're tired of British 172 scale die cast models, I apologize, but I've kind of gotten into them. Part of it is I really do like them, part of it is that's really what's available these days. Here I have two new models that you've not seen. And um, these are from Oxford, which I've talked about in the past, but they're a different series that Oxford is doing. It's like the Legends of Flights or something. It's basically their high-end model. They're uh, more feature-packed. They have spinning propellers and uh, landing gear the wheels can turn, and also the gear can be displayed up or down. And things of that nature. So I wanted to talk about these models and of course as always the history of these planes because that's what, really what I'm into. So here we have the Avro Anson. This is a Mark 1. This initially started off as a coastal patrol, maritime patrol, and kind of a jack-of-all-trades long-range light transport aircraft and kind of was fitted into the trainer role during and after World War II in Britain and elsewhere. And the other plane is the Airspeed AS-10 Oxford, which is kind of the opposite story. This was designed from the outset to be a trainer, and it was used extensively as such, but it also was adapted during World War II for more frontline or other secondary roles. And these are very similar planes, as you can tell. Size-wise, crew-wise, um, both are two-engine. Very similar speeds and performance. And both are products of the 1930s. So let's talk first about the Anson here. This dates back to 1933, when the uh, Air Ministry first kind of proposed the idea to the RAF to adopt a new maritime patrol, coastal patrol craft. Primarily the RAF had been using flying boats, which were good planes, but large and expensive and, you know, necessarily had some limitations. So they thought, hey, make a plane that's cheaper to buy and cheaper to operate to supplement our existing flying boats. And RAF was amenable to this. So uh, in 1934 they kind of narrowed the selection down to two manufacturers, Avro and De Havilland, and each were requested to produce one prototype. De Havilland would start with their DH 89 Dragon, later known as the Rapid, or Rapid, making a militarized version, the DH-89M. And Avro would start with their Model 652, making a militarized version, designated as the 652A, which would first fly in March of 19. 35. And then in May, the two planes would be tested against each other for really only about a week. And then on uh, May 25th of that year, the 652A was selected as the RAF's next maritime patrol plane and is kind of general transport. And it was given the name Anson after Admiral George Anson. Kind of funny that it wasn't named after a city, which is common in the UK. And the RAF ordered that summer 174 production planes. And the first one off the production line after a few bits of changing and tweaking.
from the prototype. Flew at the end of the year, literally, on December 23rd. And the first were delivered to RAF squadrons and entered into service in March of 1936. When this went into service, I'm not going to say it was the most modern plane in the RAF, but it was certainly not old-fashioned. As you see, it's two engines, each with a tubulated propeller made of metal, pretty advanced for the day. The front landing gear were retractable, at least semi-retractable. The tires still do stick out a wee bit, which is a common feature of this era of aircraft, for example, the B-17. But they do retract up into the engine roots there. Now the rear wheel, the tail wheel, is fixed, so that's kind of a holdover. Also a holdover, we have a wooden wing, and the body is made from... Metal supports kind of overlaid with fabric. It was a pretty traditional plane. It didn't use any radically new construction techniques. It was just, you know, known. Which made it relatively inexpensive. And made it easy to work on. Which would become assets during the war. This had a crew of three, early, at least initially. We had a pilot, the second crewman, doubled as the navigator and bomb aimer. There is a uh, bombing position in the nose for aiming down. And the third member was the radio operator, and he also operated this here rear turret. Hope I'm getting something in frame, guys. Doing my best. Speaking of the turret, the initial armament was one 303 caliber machine gun in the front, facing forward, which was used by the pilot. And then, of course, we have the turret, and it has one 303 machine gun in it, not two. It's Maximum bomb load, at least initially, was two 100-pound bombs, along with eight little 20-pounders, for a max load of about 360 pounds. Although it's worth noting later on during the war, as upgraded engines were used, they were able to bump that up to about 500 pounds using up to two 250-pound bombs. As you see, the, pretty much all the crew are doing double duty. And there was a, a little jump seat for a fourth person inside. Because originally the, um, the Avro 652 was a six-seat passenger plane. So there was space inside. So in 1938, a four-man crew became kind of the de facto standard. With the new guy just you know helping out, pitching in. That way, the pilot didn't have to fire the gun, or the bomber didn't have to double as a navigator, or they could actually operate the radio while having someone in the turret. Kind of a good idea. This plane is about 42 feet long. has a wingspan of about 56 and a half feet as you see, it's a low-wing monoplane, very high, boxy body. It could get up to about 800, excuse me, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> it could if it were in free fall, maybe. Um, it could get up to about 185 miles per hour and had a max altitude of about 19,000 feet. So not bad performance considering its size, but, you know, nowhere near other planes of the day like the Bristol Blenheim. So yeah, that's where they stood.
When World War II kicked off in September of 1939, the RAF was operating a bit over 800 of these. They, can, they were in 26 squadrons. Ten of those were by the Coastal Command, and 16 were by Bomber Command. Now, if you've seen my bomber video, you know that the Wellington was in service. Um, you had other planes in service. So the Bomber Command was already pretty much using these as second-line trainer types, or at most couriers. The Coastal Command was just starting to replace these with the Hudson. However, it had many still in frontline patrol 1939-1940. The thing is, even though it was quite advanced for 1936 because of the rapid progress of uh, tech, it was already becoming dated when World War II started, and by the middle of the war it was downright obsolescent. That said, it still had capability. For example, in 1940, in June, a flight of three Ansons was jumped by a flight of nine German BF-109s. And not only did all three Ansons make it back home, two of the BF-109s did not, with the third one limping home with many holes in it. So even though this only had two machine guns, apparently the people on that flight were very, uh, very good shots. It's also rumored, well, I mean, it, it's, it's a fact that an Anson did attack a German U-boat that year, and it's rumored that it either severely damaged it or even sunk it to the bottom, but this was never, uh, never proven. And that was kind of the, the really the last of the combat use these were deployed during the Battle of the Atlantic in 1942, especially on the American-Canadian side. That's when the heavier bombs were fitted. But that was really mostly an emergency measure. As I said, transitioning these over to trainers had already started by 1939, and really by the end of 42, it was complete. Uh, both... Uh, the Coastal Command and, and Bomber Command had moved on to other planes. Like that one. When this was a trainer, oftentimes the rear turret would be removed, unless it was needed for gunnery training. And of course, practice bombs would be used, not by live ordnance. Can't imagine why. This was a very successful design. In fact, next to the Wellington, it was the most produced plane in Britain of the war. Just a hair over 11,000 were made. Most were made in England. Over 7,000 with the balance made by Federal Aviation in Canada. And that's really where our variations come from, Mark II and so on, is with the Canadian produced planes. They were quite similar, but they were using domestic or local engines, I should say. So there are some variations, but really the Mark I was the quintessential plane with nearly 7,000 made, others converted, yada yada. You get the idea. A lot were made, a lot were used. And it did remain in use in the RAF for a long time. Not only that, but production. Even though by 1944-1945 this was pretty much a communications and transport plane, in fact it was the standard taxi transport for pilots and other military officials by the British Air Transport Authority which by the way it really earned a great reputation for mechanical reliability these things really had no major breakages which is, just goes to show you what happens when you use 
tested stuff. It would continue on in the RAF as a trainer, as well as communications aircraft. Production would not end, and Avro would deliver the last of the RAF planes in March of 1952. Now, they had also been producing for the civilian market. This was kind of retrofitted, or kind of turned back into something like the 652, where it was a six-passenger executive VIP transport or light passenger plane. And a lot of them served there. These would be taken out of Canadian service in 52, out of Australian service in 55, so they served overseas for some time. But they would keep on a long time in the RAF, with the final ones being used as communications planes not retired out until 1968, believe it or not. So not bad at all. A 32-year plus service record with 11,000 built. Most World War II era planes could not boast that. And while this thing isn't really remarkable in any one way, I think the fact that it was inexpensive and just very jack-of-all-trades, you know, adaptable, just, you know, a good transport aircraft that could be armed and could fight, at least uh, initially, really helped it keep on being relevant. So, with that said, was the Airspeed Oxford as successful. So what about the Oxbox? It really could be said to be the most successful trainer, at least bomber crew trainer of World War II. They would produce well over 8,000 about 8,750 if memory serves. And um, this is related to the Anson, in a way. In the 1930s, early on, the British government wasn't f giving a lot of funding to, um, to the Air Ministry, to the RAF. But then in 1933, a certain uh, mustachioed dictator took over in Germany. And, you know, people saw what was coming, especially after a couple of years. They began to expand the RAF, both its size and also funding for new aircraft. And one new institution that was implemented was uh, Bomber Command, which I do talk about in some depth in my uh, British Bombers of World War II video, so might check that out if you haven't. And of course, once you start to have Bomber Command, you need bombers. An early one would be the Wellington, but then we would get into the Manchester and Stirling and Lancaster and so on and so forth. They needed a trainer. At first, it was considered maybe just get a specialized version of the Anson. But then they decided, no, it doesn't really have all the features they need. It's not quite modern enough for what they're wanting. Again, just a couple of years worth of time is a lot of development in the 1930s tech tree. And it didn't fly the way they wanted. Honestly, it was too too easy of a flyer. They wanted something that could provide a bit more challenge for its pilots and that could more realistically simulate RAF bombers. So, in July of 1936, the Air Ministry ordered a two-engine prototype from Airspeed for a primary trainer with some secondary capabilities if needed. 
and um, Airspeed decided to take its existing AS-6 Envoy and militarize it, which honestly it had already done for about half a dozen planes for the South African government. So it had some experience and had some ideas, and you know, and other you know once you do once you have ideas of how to improve it, and the uh, Air Ministry gave the thumbs up to this plan and placed an initial order for about. 135. Since this was based on an existing design, just updated, the prototype first flew in June of 1937, and the first production models were beginning to be delivered to the RAF by November of that year. And when World War II kicked off in September of 39, about 370 of all versions were in service with the uh, RAF being used as trainers. It's also worth pointing out an early adopter, someone, an early order came from the New Zealand Air Force. Canada would soon follow suit in 1938 ordering some and actually kind of buying parts kits and assembling them in Canada at Vickers Canada and South Africa and Australia would follow suit in 1940 even the USA when it entered the war in 1942 was loaned about 135 of these which it operated as communications and light transports, mostly within the UK. And it would continue to use these in the Army Air Force. Till, you know, a little after D-Day, by which time American planes pretty much phased them out and they were returned to, to Britain. Considering all the Lend-Lease that, you know, we gave them, it was only very fair. There were two basic versions. The Mark I would have a turret back here, and the Mark II would not. Now, internally, this is an interesting plane because it was made as a trainer. The seats were movable. You could kind of rearrange the interior. You could have two pilot's seats or a pilot co-pilot or a pilot instructor up front or you could have one seat and you could have a navigator you could have a radio operator or a turret gunner or both of course you also had uh, bomb aiming capability in the nose for bombing training this was really used for a lot of training it was, of course, a flight trainer, both daytime and nighttime, as well as visual and instrument. It was also used to help train direction finding and other navigation techniques. And you would have three men in here essentially training up an entire crew at once. While the pilot was learning his craft, the navigator could be learning his, the radio operator could be warning you know, working the wireless, and of course your weapons guys could learn to actually aim and hit something. This plane is a little smaller than the Anson. It's under 35 feet long, and the wingspan is a bit over 53 feet. So it's not tiny, but it's not huge. It is faster than the Anson. It can get up to about 190 miles per hour. And it has a much higher ceiling. It can get up to 23,500 feet. As you can tell, it's a more modern design. It still is a tail dragger with the wheel on the back. But our front wheels are now fully enclosed by the engine roots. It's a much sleeker design. This there, there was still wood in here, 
for example, the uh, the tail had some wood parts, but it was more metal, less fabric. Originally, the engines would actually have wood propellers, but later that would be switched to metal. I believe the wing was metal. Certainly later on it was, but maybe... don't really know. Apologize. As you notice, the nose is very short and streamlined. This gave very good visibility, very high-sitting cockpit with good place windows so it gave you know yeah and really the whole cockpit was pretty advanced and modern for the day and time it had a lot of modern avionics and stuff the only real armaments this had the dorsal turret would have one 303 machine gun there's not any standard in the nose and as standard, it could carry up to 16 11-pound practice bombs. However, in 1941, in the Iraqi theater, the RAF did convert about two dozen of these to carry live ordnance to help defend their position against enemy Iraqi troops. So, even when this was developed, one of the things, they wanted to make sure it could be armed up if necessary. Also seems like some of these were used as coastal patrol planes, spotter planes. Many were used, especially in the Middle East, as air ambulances, a role they were very well suited for. They were also, as I said, used for communications Passenger transport, VIP, that kind of thing. So they saw many, many uses during the war. The majority would be produced by airspeed, about 5,000. De Havilland would also make another large majority, about 1,500. And the balance would be made by Percival and uh, a company called Standard Motors. So these were produced by four primary factories and of course with several uh, subcontractors besides. The RAF would keep using these after World War II, although not as long as the Anson, which as I said wasn't retired fully, completely until 1968. The Oxford was more or less pulled out of service by 1956. But with nearly 9,000 in the world, with many foreign customers, these did get around. For example, the Greek Air Force had some. Uh, many Middle East customers. As I mentioned, uh, Australia, New Zealand. Yeah, they got around. They really did. So, some stayed in service. Others were sold as surplus and were turned into civilian passenger planes. And there was even some later versions of the Oxford that were made, turned out from the factory, specifically as civilian planes. So, again, a good general purpose plane, much like the Anson, just more modern and a little faster, much higher altitude, and a much more adaptable interior. And that is the Oxbox. So, what about these models in general? Well, um, I'll say this. They're, they're no Corgi. They're no Hobby Master. Either in quality or price. But that's not to say they're not worth it. I mean, these are, in this series... Anywhere from $35 up to 60 depending on individual planes. Obviously, the bigger ones are going to cost more. The Oxford here has a large amount of metal. It's a lighter metal than you would find in a Corgi. But it is mostly metal. On top of the wing... And I've noticed the undersides of these tend to be plastic polymer. It's um, it's kind of a light polymer too. 
but it is a little flexible, which is actually good. You you want a little bit of bend. You don't want something so brittle that it's just going to snap off. That's kind of the problem I have with a Merkham. Their plastic is just delicate. Your good brands, Hobby Master and Corgi, they have a little flex built in because these things will fall. As I said, it does come with gear up or down. It has a very simple stand. It just has a hole in the bottom. So the stand, while well, a little fancier than the standard Oxford stand, still pegs in much the same way. And one thing I like about Oxford, if you notice, it sits on the stand tilted over. That's great because it means you can put them side by side on a shelf, getting many more in without the wings banging together. I kind of wish, you know, Corgi has quite a few models you can tilt. Hobby Master does not. That's just good for storage purposes. Plus, I think it looks kind of cool. Gives it that banking in flight. So, I really actually do like this Oxford because no one else has done an Airspeed AS10, as far as I'm aware, in 172 diecast. You just find, like, the easy models and models. It's a simple but solid plane. And they have a few different variants. These do come in a very posh box. Very nice. Um, kind of feel bad throwing them out. Yes, I do. I did throw my boxes out because I do not have space. Sorry. And I'm not a box collector. That's what I said about guns. It applies to aircraft models as well. I'm not a box collector. Sorry. I kind of wish they put a little less energy into the box. And a little more into the plane. Not to say they're exactly sloppy, but, you know, seams and stuff. And again, there's the undersides plastic. I would have been happy with a simple box and a full metal underside. But that's just me. But it is one of the nicest boxes I've seen. The Anson, I'm a little more mixed on. It's heavier than the Oxford, as it should be. It's a bigger plane. The turret does rotate, which is nice. It has landing gear up or down, and the gear are actually made of metal with rubber tires, and the tires do spin. Actually, we think the tires are plastic, but the struts are metal. But the wheels do spin. It's got a, you know, nice cockpit and glass in the front. It, too, has the plastic underside of the wing, but then the metal is on the top. The nose is metal. And the tail part is metal, but one thing that bugs me about this, this middle part is plastic. It's just kind of a plastic insert from about here to the cockpit. I know why they did it, because it has a lot of detailing, and it would be hard to press this in to die cast and make it look good, especially with all the windows. So from a production point, I don't have a problem with it being plastic. But again, like I said, the plastic they use is kind of a lighter... It's durable enough, but it, it does feel a little cheap compared to what Corgi or Hobby Master use. But it does still feel better than, say, a Merkham. So, I'm, I'm mixed feelings on this. That said, I really wanted an Anson, especially one that had the intact turret. This is a... There we go. This is an example of a 1937 Coastal Command. So this is, you know, pre-trainer. This is a military, you know, frontline version. That's really what I wanted. They do make trainer specific ones as well but I was happy they made this model so all in all I'm glad I have it this one was about uh, 45 which is about right um, maybe it was 40 you know it's still half the price of a Corgi and third of a Hobby Master so I think you get what you pay for with these and I definitely like them better I would much rather pay 40 even 50 for this than the basic Oxford, which is anywhere from 20 to 30, which has non-spinning propellers and landing gear in the fixed up position, and I'm sure would not have a moving turret either. The, the standard line of Oxfords are very static. They're durable, but they often lack detail. They have kind of real thick panel lines, and the, uh, the seams are quite visible. And they're visible on these two. But yeah, Oxford has definitely upped their game with this new series, and I hope they continue it. One they're doing is the Westland Dragonfly that's coming out at the end of this year, which is a helicopter, and I'm really looking forward to that. I'm just, when I buy these, I'm kind of, re not reluctant, but I buy them slowly because 
I don't have quite the confidence in them that I do at Core Gear Hobby Master, but it's growing. I haven't had one that I think is absolute crap. But, um, yeah, I'll take it slow. Grab one or so a month, and especially for things that no other brand makes. Well, guys, it's been a long week here for me. I wanted to do a fun video. I, I have fun making these. Uh, I hope you have fun watching them. hope I get something on the screen for you. But uh, the, I find making these relaxing, especially when it's been a long, stressful week at work. But, um, but yeah. If you want to identify these, this is what I found is odd about these Oxfords. The advertising is pretty vague. You can usually tell by the part number. They'll start off with like OX then 72 and then they'll have like a, a prefix like AS or AN and then usually 001002 because they're starting kind of over so you can usually tell these by the by the prefix not to mention the price tag whereas the standard Oxfords usually start with like AC or something and then they have a much larger number and they don't have 72 in the number so that's kind of how I've been able to determine which of these is the Legends of Flights? There's just not much info out there on these. So I hope this provides some help to someone else that was in my position. Because I couldn't find anything on these out there. Aside from a few adverts from maybe like three websites. So I thought, why not do a video? Well, with that said, I'm going to sign off. If you could, like, share, and subscribe. And check out some of my other videos. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.